I would have to start now. So, yeah, I, I'm afraid that we have to go like it is now. All right, so. Welcome. I'm Horacio Espinosa, director of the TAM program at Northwestern University, which was founded in the 1960s. TAM is an interdisciplinary program with 30 faculty members from five departments, mechanical engineering, civil and environmental engineering, engineering science and applied math, biomedical engineering and material science and engineering. Today is my pleasure to introduce a lecture by my colleague, Dene Bajan. Zeneg is a native of Prague. He received his PhD in 1963 without formally being a graduate student. For political reasons, he was admitted for graduate studies and prepared his dissertation with no advisor while working as a bridge engineer, an experience that he enjoyed very much. After visiting, visiting stints in Paris, Toronto, Toronto and UC Berkeley, he joined Northwestern in 1969 and became full professor in 1973. Since 1919, he has held a Murphy professorship and since 2002, a McCormick Institute professorship. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Art and Sciences, the Royal Society of London, and eight other national academies. He received several major medals in his field of research and in 2016, the American Society for Civil Engineers instituted a medal bearing his name. Although Zdenek is basically a theoretician, he has always been interested in designing innovative experiments that could be used to gain mechanistic insights and validate theories. A couple of examples are his size effect method for measuring the fracture characteristics of concrete and other quasi breathing materials which became an international standard recommendation of RILEM. Another is the investigation of the post-peak instability observed in fracture tests of fiber composites, which confirm that composites follow an energetic size effect law. His lecture today will explore the suitability of the use of a single parameter in characterizing the fracture of quasi-brittle materials. It is known that such materials present a number of deformation and damage mechanisms that are not captured by deformation theory. As a result, they require the development of experiments that can explore more complex stress conditions at crack tips and the so-called process zone, which in quasi-brittle materials can be of significant size as my own work on biomaterials demonstrated. Zdenek, the audience is all yours. All right, let me share the screen. There, uh, make it large. Okay, so uh, good morning uh, or good evening, depending on where you are. I am delighted to present you some results that we are ex excited about, which may have an effect, broad effect on fracture mechanics, particularly quasi-abical fracture mechanics. I have here uh, outstanding collaborator. Much of the work was done by Huang Guian, doctor candidate. Uh, I have two faculty collaborators, Gianluca Cusates, and from UIC, uh, uh, Moxen Issa, Professor Moxen Issa, uh, Madura Patiraj, who just finished his doctorate, and uh, Reza is still a doctoral student. So, what uh, is the problem? The problem is. Uh, crack parallel stress, parallel to the crack plane. Now it is interesting to note that all the fracture press specimens uh, that are standard and used have essentially zero uh, uh, normal stress parallel to the crack plane. Even the uh, wedge split specimen has a very small value and in fact the stress is also not uniform. So, uh, Wait a minute. What happened? Okay. Doesn't work. 
So why has uh, this stress been ignored? Well, one reason is that if we consider a homogeneous field of tensile stress and cut a line, then there is no change in the stress. So there was no difference at the beginning. Uh, when it goes to line cracks, then of course the only parameter that can matter is a fracture energy or cohesive crack model. I did 100 years old, Griffiths, cohesive model, Warren 1959. But the reality is different. Every crack, and it's important, particularly quasi materials, has a finite fracture process zone, finite in length, and finite also in width. And there's a trail of unloaded damage behind it. And this is the fracture process. And what we see at the end is, of course, one crack. But uh, this process does matter. Uh, we deal uh, in this talk uh, uh, with quasi bitter materials. Uh, repeat, these are materials with brittle constituents, but in homogeneity size uh, and or the RVE or fracture process on si size are not negligible compared to structure size. This includes many materials, uh, concrete, the arch typical case, in which this phenomenon is easiest observed uh, because the process zone is about uh, half a meter long. And now this material is also by far the widest used material in terms of cost uh, and volume. And it is also of environmental concern because uh, production of cement will exceed soon uh, the emissions of CO2 from all the cars and trucks in the world. Uh, and obviously cracking and energy durability so uh, that's uh, one way to mitigate it. And tough ceramics, fabric composite, rocks, bonds, and so forth. And I should point out probably same phenomena occur on the micrometer scale, even for fine grain ceramics and metals. Uh, the concept of quasi is of course relative. This is concrete. If we consider sea ice pushing on the platform legs, uh, it's a very heterogeneous material, it's about five meters. If we consider Arctic Ocean cover as a whole on the range of 1,000 kilometers, then process on size about 10 kilometers. Uh, on the other hand, if we go to textile composites, that is maybe of the order of centimeters, in gas or oil shale, one to three millimeters. This was our recent interest. And let me point out that if we go to MEMS, or polysilicone and materials, which I omit here, this order of microns. We have to distinguish from, in my viewpoint, uh, three types of fracture mechanics. Of course, the linear fracture mechanics, the fracture process on a point, originally by Griffiths. Then in 1950s, we got the nonlinear fracture mechanics, uh, ductile strain hardening materials. There is a large process zone surrounding the crack tip, not process a large uh, nonlinear zone, hardening plastic but the process is still a point. It's of micrometer size typically. And when they make quasi-bitter materials where there is no nonlinear hardening zone, no plastic zone, uh, elasticity immediately goes to damage. And that has lengths and widths which are significant. And is manifested in the distribution of stress uh, uh, be behind the uh, rear crack tip. Now what we find is this. Uh, I will later explain how. This is a plot of fracture energy relative to its value as parallel, uh, crack parallel stress being zero for concrete. And this is uh, the horizontal axis is a crack parallel stress uh, uh, normalized to uh, uniaxial strengths. So this is this point. This is then we increase it. And then fracture energy goes up in our test almost doubles. Uh, this is a result of uh, regression of nine tests. And then when we increase it higher, it goes down. Eventually, uh, we go way down and eventually to zero. And I'd like to discuss this curve. It's obtained by micro per model, uh, M7 version. 
So what is the basic idea of this test? We want to have a test set, uh, we want to generate a parallel compression uniform uh, in this area uniform. And we want to also generate bending. So we want to superpose it such that they are combined. We have bending from the end reactions in this three point bend specimen. And here's the compressions. How to do that? Well, we can do that by the gap test. Uh, now the idea in this test is the following. We uh, use this basically three point bent specimen, install it, but the supports are left with a gap. And to generate the compression, we use plastic pads. We play with various materials. One could use some metal skin, for example, but settled on polyethylene. Uh, which we compress, then it's all has almost horizontally plateau uh, to constant stress, and then the gap closes, and as it closes, it generates bending moment. So first compression, compression remains constant, and if it's constant, please note, uh, constant load is equivalent to applied load. So uh, in the second stage, we actually have a static determinate state again. That's very important for evaluation because it greatly simplifies the evaluation and makes it unambiguous. So in the second stage, the static system is this, three degrees of freedom are blocked. Uh, now, what is the low deflection curve? So we get the elastic response of the pads in the first stage, then we reach a plateau and then the gap closes and uh, the uh, end supports carry bending moment. So the factor goes uh, effective, goes up with peak load, post peak. And this we see on the stroke. Uh, we of course control those tests by CTOD, corrective open displacement uh, to have perfect stability and avoid the random, random slap throughs. And we get then this kind of behavior. The setup is more detail shown here. So here is the extensometer, which controls the test. This is the polypropylene block, the gap. Uh, DIC, of course, is useful for verifying the stress field. And here are the response of the pads. Now, I, there is a mild slope, but the rise during the test is about half a percent. So that's negligible compared to all the errors, uh, errors in, the, uh, in the evaluation. Uh, here are the pictures of our specimens. Again, with a, with a gauge, controlling gauge, plastic pads, uh, rollers with a gap, loading. Uh, here is, uh, okay. So now the stress field. So uh, this is a picture of the principal stress vectors in compression, the compressive principal stress vectors. So this is the loading from the pad and you see they are, the lines of the vectors are parallel, the spacing remains constant. We have virtually constant stress field here, not outside. Now, of course, under the pad is not exactly uniform. So there is slight difference between this average stress on the pad, sigma pad, and the stress here, and we make a correction for that. Now when we apply the bending moment, we introduce uh, transverse principal stresses, there are principal stress vectors, uh, but please note that does not disturb the original stress field. So we still have a basically uniform stress field in compression in the, uh, in the other direction. Uh, before the virus, we did 27 tests that we had to stop. We planned to do tensile tests, uh, uh, so that was not done yet. Uh, it requires slightly different arrangement. Uh, we put a uh, uh, notch on top. We put not plastic pads here, steel pads, steel, uh, steel plates. We put uh, 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 glued uh, polypropylene uh, pad on, on the side. And we load through uh, really rigid steel straps, steel frames with a gap, otherwise similar procedure. Again, you go from one static determinate state to another static determinate state, which is great for evaluation. Now the pads, of course, we, all, we want to obtain a minimum zero slope. Uh, uh, polypropylene is uh, in that state, plastic state is incompressible. 
So the only thing that matters is some small but non-negligible shear modulus. It cannot be zero, otherwise the material would flow out, uh, but it's very small. And uh, uh, we made a calculation uh, that if I equate uh, the work uh, done on the, by the road on a certain uh, length uh, here uh, and equate it to uh, the energy to deform within, the, uh, within this uh, distance, I get differential equation integrated. I get a simple formula under assumed distribution. Actually, if you take different distribution, it doesn't make much difference. If you use it. So we get this formula for a strip, for a circle, and it's more complicated for other things. Obviously, optimize the paths means decreasing the lateral widths and increase the height. But this is limited, of course, by stability uh, of a thick body, uh, Haring's equation for shear, shear fracture. Uh, now, uh, how to avoid the fracture energy? I have long favored, uh, uh, started 30 years ago, uh, more than that, the size effect method of evaluating it. Now, here I have to point out first that we need to distinguish causal determinants generally uh, that there is a complicated softening relation, sigma versus effective stress separation, delta. So in concrete, uh, it goes steeply down and uh, then there's a long tail uh, that now it is, and it is similar to other materials. Uh, so what matters for maximum load we have to realize is only the initial part. Maximum loads, uh, loads of structures generally don't enter the stage. So this is need for need, for example, for design of structures uh, for low capacity. Uh, uh, now, if, if we, of course, speak of energy absorption, like an impact, then we need the tail, and that's G capital F. Uh, this has been generally accepted for concrete for the last mm, 25 years. Before um, uh, it was uh, considered to be straight line or, uh, or, uh, or exponential, Hilleborg. And then actually, if we use that, we get the impossible conclusion that the fraction energy is uh, size dependent. Uh, so we cast specimens of different sizes. Uh, uh, we've used only one to four sizes, one to two to four notched uh, uh, concrete, uh, cast simultaneously, same batch, same age. So there is no, no other issues, uh, it's uh, picture the loading. And now uh, we exploit the size effect law. Now, let me repeat, that came in 1964, 1984. Uh, most rigorously 2004, derived from uh, dimensional analysis, uh, similitude arguments and energy balance. Now, but from cohesive law and all these arguments, one can show rigorously the following. If the size is going to zero, uh, the, uh, asymptotically, the nominal strength, which is low divided by cross-section area, which is a part of the load, is uh, a constant, minus a linear term. This is normalizing constant, so it's linear. In log log plot, it appears as an exponential. Now for size going to infinity, the asymptotic expansion uh, has a term of linear fracture mechanics in front, and the second term is linear in one over D, and that's essential. So if you plot these two uh, terms, we get curves like this, the dashed curves, and then we use asymptotic matching. There are various ways to do that. That's come start up thinking fluid mechanics, and you get this curve with a simple formula. So uh, this is, has been now generally accepted. It's actually now enshrined in the ACI code for designing uh, con all concrete structures for brittle failures. That is in beam shear, uh, in uh, punch, punching of slabs, in uh, uh, stratum tie uh, actions, and so forth. Now this formula, can be related, that came in 1990, uh, to linear elastic fracture mechanics by uh, equivalent, uh, either by equivalent linear elastic fracture mechanics uh, for a large process zone or from J integral or so. Uh, in this formula, elastic modulus, uh, fracture energy, uh, this is energy release function 
which is obtained for this factor. This is relative Craig length. Craig length divided by D and uh, zero means it is for the initial uh, length of the, of the real Craig or, or the notch. And so this simple formula uh, can be easily converted to linear regression. Uh, we plot one over nominal strength uh, normalized by this on the vertical axis. We plot uh, D, linear D on the other axis. We get a straight line. Uh, regression line is easily passed. And uh, the inverse slope is then the fracture energy. And from the intercept, we get effective size of the process zone. The CF is not exactly Irwin's uh, L0. It's about 40% of it. Uh, the precise relation has been established to Irwin's length. Uh, so it's about 40% of the uh, effective length of the process zone. Uh, these are our data. So we should have used for a bigger range, but it was uh, to turn out to be enough. These are data in log log plot, nominal strength versus size. And in the linear for regression plot, we got a remarkable agreement for the means exactly on the straight line. That's uh, amazing. And this gives us the characteristic legs, the intercept. Now, there is another method, uh, older one, uh, originated from uh, by Nakayama for uh, ceramics, later uh, as, as for fictitious Craig model by Hilleborg. Uh, namely, we measure the energy of the low deflection curves of the specimen. P. So this is this area. And we divide it by the length of the ligament uh, or area of the ligament and we get fracture energy. Uh, yes, it would work in theory, but in practice turned out it's very poor for concrete. The reason is, uh, the reason are several. First of all, we, it is hard to estimate the tail. Usually the machines don't, uh, don't go so far to get it. More seriously, because of large process zone, the fracture process zone first grows, grows, the center of it is moving forward. Then it travels essential constant size. And when it comes to the opposite side, it again diminishes to zero. So if, uh, actually the energy release rate uh, is not uniform. It's curved, so if you divide by the length, we miss something. So uh, that's also so can be manifested by uh, by J integral various ways. So I think this is generally accepted. And in fact, this method has huge scatter, uh, and uh, it gives different results for different sizes, of course, because it changes the ligament. Very different. There was been recently uh, uh, recently observed and has been accepted now by ACI Committee on Fracture Mechanics. Uh, so now the results. So I already showed this curve. These are the nine tests that we carried out for two, three, two, these two sizes on the crack parallel stress. This is high stress, uh, low stress. And this is the initial fracture energy normalized. Now for calibration of the calculation by microplane model, we used only this point. Uh, uh, that is fraction is just zero. We normalize it to match this value uh, at zero uh, from standard test specimen, zero correct parallel stress. And we, of course, uh, also normalize it to uh, calibrate it to get the correct strength of the material, compression strength and uh, uh, split, uh, split cylinder strengths. And from this only, and using D4 parameters that can be changed, of course, we predicted this curve. So I think it's pretty good, actually. Uh, well, of course, error of 10%, here an error of 1%. Now I to show two curves, please. Uh, uh, what we, on the pad, the average stress is dashed line. So I pointed out needs to be corrected. The correction coefficient is in this case 96%. And this is the stress exactly uh, on the, in the fracture process zone, which is what matters for the material law. Uh, Uh, we get also information on the characteristic lengths. That also varies. That uh, is not a constant. Uh, uh, this is at zero power stress, goes up, somewhat different curve, but it's strengthening and then goes down. And uh, here we have uh, somewhat bigger error uh, from the microplane model, but uh, it's a significant change. What is the explanation? 
Of course, we will do particle model LDPM. I will not talk about it. Kusatis is working on it, my, my collaborator. Uh, and uh, we can explain intuitively. So fracture process on as many cracks, and it is, has been shown in Northwestern in 1990s that in concrete, 70% of the fracture energy is not dissipated by micro cracking, by crack opening actually, mode one type. Is 70% uh, is dissipated by slip, frictional slip, aggregate interlock, that sort of things. So, uh, uh, all right, so first, this moderate, uh, this is the beginning of the curve, strengthening phase, moderate compression. We basically increase uh, increase uh, the static friction and block slip, but later on, when actually this compression is big enough, uh, we get uh, we do get slip, and when we get slip, it causes widening, and that causes splitting cracks. Uh, that's well documented phenomenon, and that causes weakening of the material. So that's why the curve of GF shows strengthening phase and weakening phase. I suspect in, in, uh, in fiber composites, which you haven't tested yet, this probably will be absent. There will be weakening probably from the beginning. Now, we can do extrapolations. Uh, the microplane model did reasonably good work. So we can uh, use it for predict some other situations. And that's what I will be doing now. So, we use the same microplane model. We, of course, want to test it. Uh, what happens uh, at, uh, for example, but actually this, I don't know how it, they will be hard to test. Uh, when there is a, a crack power stress in the anti-plane direction, sigma ZZ, and this is the axis of sigma XX. So the constant ratio to sigma, uh, to the strengths, we keep it constant. You see, it has significant effect, the, 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 the crack power stress. And also uh, uh, the red curve, uh, when it's high, it's, it's weakening, it's strengthening both way. It also affects characteristic lengths and significantly, as you see here, it's a characteristic lengths. And uh, so that's uh, uh, another variable. Uh, we didn't check sigma XZ, crack plane shear, but surely will have effect too. Now, how it compares to other models? So there are, Many models, uh, the best one in terms of uh, uh, non microplane, uh, in terms of stress tensor invariance, is this model of Grassel, which is a Bacchus, I think, ex extension of previous model of Irase Grassel. So that model is shown here, not too bad, but certainly worse than the microplane. Uh, this is strengthening here, and then this is uh, goes high to late and uh, something to see. Now other models on, on commercial codes. So for example, Drucker Prager, it does some hardening in the first stage, but that is hopeless. This is everything. It can be documented and explained by the stress distributions. Uh, then uh, we uh, turn to fiber reinforced concrete, which is of great interest for many for large scale applications, it improves ductility. Uh, putting short fibers about one inch length, steel or uh, polymer, these are steel fibers, ceramics, C percent content. And our microplane model was calibrated by many tests already some eight years ago by Ferru Jenner for fiber house to predict also uh, fiber, fiber force concrete, takes it into account the pull out of the uh, fibers and all these corrections. So you see that it has a big effect. This is the curve now in a shorter scale uh, that I showed before for no fibers. Uh, crack power stress is here. So the strength of is delayed, but later comes on as the fibers are pulling up. But uh, uh, eventually you get also all the way down, but at higher stress, not surprisingly. So a very different change, but significant effect still. Characteristic length is also changed. Uh, as the beginning is diminished, the strengthening phase in the uh, 
softening case uh, steep down, but comes later on. Uh, big interest to us uh, and to many people is fracking. Uh, at, at this town is dead, but uh, it's for a revive. So uh, uh, we consider shale, and that's another dimension of complexity. We need an isotropy, which is typically in elastic modulus about uh, two to one or three to one. We used M7 microplane model for concrete, adapted it, and ex uh, extended by a uh, microplane system uh, arranged on a cylinder, sort of cylindrical. That was calibrated by Kurt Bali at Northwestern in uh, many tests. Uh, and we uh, now use uh, this model to predict what would happen. Uh, we, we plan to do this with Los Alamos jointly, but now virus prevents that. Uh, 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 on shale. Uh, so these are specimens uh, which have a notch normal to the bedding. This is the normal case hydraulic fracturing. The bedding is horizontal. Hydraulic fracture is typically vertical because of enormous overburden pressure. But if we have a correct parallel to the bedding plane, it's very different. You see the difference here. So similar behavior in the red for the vertical, uh, rather different here. Uh, and the characteristic length also changes, increases a lot here, a lot less here. So these are things to be, these are speculations. These are uh, tests are yet to be made. Uh, now, one aspect is uh, interesting. Uh, how is the history dependent? So our gap test is now plotted in the axis sigma xx correct parallel and this is the axis of nominal strength uh, which is basically load parameter or effective uh, effective k1 so we travel this way and then uh, when the gap closes we go up this is the fatal point if we reverse the pass first apply the bending moment which we don't know how to do experimentally but this is theoretical uh, and then introduce the crack parallel stress, we end up here. So it's a big difference. If we load proportionally, the difference of the first is about 15%. This is, this can be done. Uh, we have done it, but uh, this, uh, this can be done yeah, here. However, what if we load first uh, K1, first close gap, and then we increase the load. Uh, uh, no, sorry. What if we go to, uh, I already explained. What if we first increase not to 90%, but to 40%? That also show previous curve. The failure point is here. That's for my previous curve. And for my test, actually. This is actually testing. These, these two points are tests. If we reverse it, then uh, actually we get failure before we are able to apply corporal stress. So, uh, there's an enormous effect of uh, the path of the history of the loading in this diagram. You see that we cannot have a formula using the current state. We have to calculate uh, through the history. Now, that uh, uh, proportional loading can be produced by the system, which we tried eventually abandoned because it's somewhat difficult to set it up. Uh, it's certainly possible, but. Uh, not convenient. Uh, so we have a test sample here, and uh, we have now uh, very rigid beams, steel beams with steel pads, uh, uh, also here on both sides. And we put a movable su symmetric support here. If the support is, is near the notch, we get correct parallel stress. If it's at the end, we get bending only, and we get combinations in between. And that's the way to produce the parallel behavior. I would like now to uh, mention what was done before. Of course, people suspected these kind of effects. One was the Czech who came with a pioneering idea to use wedge splitting tests. So here is the wedge uh, notch uh, pushing apart uh, the concrete flanks. Uh, and he installed hydraulic jacks. There's a gap below, so they don't contact. 
and uh, control them by another hydraulic jack. Now they are heavy, of course, especially if you get them to side effect, it will be very heavy. So the complete is evaluation, there is a bending moment. The problem with this test is also that the, the, the unit stress of the state is not uniform here. Basically, there is two uh, bands of compression, V-shape of high compression, somewhat less here. So it is uh, hard, uh, harder to interpret what it means. And basic problem is in you use the side effect method. If you use side effect method, use the work of fracture method. I discussed it before in these problems. I uh, gave very scattered results. Uh, you use a side effect method, you would run into other problems. Uh, although, uh, uh, basically, you evaluate energy dissipated from the side effect, but it corresponds to changing sigma x. So how you correlate it to one particular value? It, it would mean fitting the resulting curves uh, with a final program with uh, assumed very good uh, constitutive damage law and do an uh, in, uh, iterative analysis to optimize. So actually, uh, unfortunately, has, uh, was, uh, this idea had no effect on the fracture community was not considered further. I should also say that the idea of terrestrial axiality is not new. It was uh, considered uh, in 19, early 1990s by several people for elastoplastic metals, particularly Fong, Xi, Hancock, Vigo Vergard, and others. Uh, and it was found that uh, it, uh, it leads to correction to the uh, J integral by extra, uh, extra parameter Q obtained by integrating on an annulus around through the plastic field, but the process was still a point, of course. And another case of terraxality was considered by Cotter and Rice, where T stress in basically early FM was shown to cause deflection of the curve. So these are important and uh, interesting problems, but different, uh, different things than what we are discussing today. Uh, now, if in the time that I have left, I would like to discuss the various implications uh, largely speculatively. So, you see, we have a curve of, uh, of GF versus a relative xi relative parallel stress. It can be easily fitted by formula. We very accurately produces the curve. So one might think perhaps putting it on abacus and modifying uh, the program by changing the, uh, changing the fracture energy. But of course, that would work only for uh, one material it would not introduce the enormous effect of past dependence. So uh, it would hardly help. In Koizikler model, it would mean adjusting the shape and uh, cohesive law. X film is based on LEFM, except some modi late modifications. So that's not really the solution. This formula is perhaps interesting, but I don't think it would help much. Adjustment of the cohesive law, please imagine. Uh, we have many questions appearing. Is a steeper slope? or lower strengths or changing uh, the rest of it. So that's uh, not, uh, uh, not really uh, the way to go. Uh, now, it will be more difficult even for anisotropic fiber polymer composites. Uh, I expect a large effect there. Bioxid is strong, for example, in a pressurized fuselage, the crack, uh, likes to run uh, uh, longitudinally, uh, but there is back suit tension hoop, which is double the logical, uh, logical stress uh, in addition to logical tension. So this phenomenon will be affecting this, will be changing fracture energy. Uh, in the lamination fracture, sure, this is about to happen. Now, from all this discussion, we see that the paramount uh, effect is the tensorial aspect of the process zone. We have to model quasi fracture by damage mechanics with a realistic tensorial damage model. Now, uh, I, uh, to do a good one, one can do in some materials checks on many tests. 
So in concrete, actually, the fractured process on being two feet, the specimens that we test are basically at the side of the fracture process zone. And so for these, we have lots of tests, the unit by atraxial proportion, unproportional post peak softening, uh, 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 tension compression unloading. Uh, and all, all these have been made by micro model, actually. Uh, one, there are two particular aspects uh, I would like to point out. Microplane model, which essentially uh, corresponds to a very large number of surfaces, uh, vectorial uh, on the other microplanes, automatically produces non associated dilatancy in frictional slip. And it's been demonstrated. And uh, it is done in, in a, without violating dissipation inequality. Dissipation is always positive. Uh, in tensile models, we know uh, and people accept it, we have to violate this. Uh, so that's one big advantage. But it's even more serious is the vertex effect. Uh, namely, when you, for example, load well, parallel to the loading surface. So for example, we did a test implying compression well beyond the uh, 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 elastic limit into softening also. And then we introduced torsion and the initial increment by any tensor model with invariance and loading surfaces would give you elastic increment. But the truth for concrete is this. Uh, for moderate compression, test is here. Tensor models are all here. For large compression, we are here. Uh, so this is something to pay attention to. It has been generally ignored. In computational mechanics, it's totally ignored. It has been <coughs> discussed. Uh, by Hutchinson and Christofferson with uh, 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 Western Zora near Northwestern 1980s. Uh, we did not find any good general model, only ad hoc modeling. And the idea was abandoned, but please, composition mechanics has to wake up. This is not something to neglect. Let's say if you have an earthquake, uh, so first the co column is under vertical compression, then comes shear. Uh, this is typical compression is chief following compression, and this is missed by all the models we have. By microwave model can do that. Uh, now, the models that are in the literature, this is sort of a critique, they are work for one set of circumstances. It is very easy to model one crack. Uh, it can be done by a sharp crack or band, it doesn't matter because the only thing that matters so overall uh, in fact, a band and a sharp crack differ by effective surface factor only by 1% for this mesh that I showed here. Uh, both give the same results. Now, to model this, we have 100 different models. There are actually about 100 different models for concrete in the computational literature, uh, different. So uh, we can model this by softening curve, scalar. We can also model it by softening uh, the uh, first invariant, Mazar model. We can model by softening J2 uh, of the deviator, sort of one Mises type. Uh, all these can model very well fracture tests uh, of single cracks. But it's different if you consider many cracks, especially if you consider parallel cracks, or if you consider, of course, the gap test. Uh, so, uh, uh, meaningful analysis should pay attention to these to these points. Now, parallel cracks are a very interesting problem. In reinforced concrete, uh, softening usually localizes into one crack, but there are many situations where it does not. So, I show here a great site of Devil's Post Park in the in Sierra Nevada. These are about 30 meters tall columns of uh, in a cooled lava, which cooled maybe over 10,000 years, and then was exposed. And you see there's no subdivision of these cracks. They grow parallel next to each other all the time. And if you look on top, there are hexagonal features. There are no sub cracks that goes over the time. Uh, obviously, it is different from drying cracks, which are here for small, small uh, cracks, and then they close, then bigger cracks, and so it goes. It has been shown that this system of power cracks, if we have drying or cooling, 
uh, then they subdivide and they create isolated cracks. But if we have a hydraulic fracture and if we manage to have uniform pressure here, uniform or uniform eigenstrain, strain, then they grow forever in parallel theoretically. Uh, uh, and all right, so uh, obviously the width of the fractures is important. And what is the role of these widths? Well, it is hard to define for one crack. But actually, the main role of this crack it dictates the spacing of parallel cracks. Spacing of parallel cracks, and uh, uh, there can be certain spacing and not smaller than that, uh, uh, as, as we observe. And this is dictated by the effective width of the process zone, and it's it's model also computational. If we go to uh, I mentioned fracking. This is a horizontal cut. Uh, we have a uh, here we have a primary crack, uh, and we want to subdivide. So uh, all the programs uh, LDFM and the Coyote model gives no subdivisions, but we found if we go to poro mechanics, uh, bio coefficient being anisotropic, and uh, penetration of pressure inside which. Uh, these gradient of pore pressure generate pressures which open cracks. And if we consider that there are pre existing uh, damage, weak, weak zones, actually, uh, people think sometimes there are exist pre existing natural cracks. No, we showed they must have caused by creep uh, some 50 million years ago or so. Uh, but there is a damage zone. So then we get this kind of pattern. And that yeah, that's done in this case by Macoplay model. Uh, and, uh, but we need now, we need one correction. Uh, that was done a year ago. We did not know about the crack power stress and that correction has to be introduced. It may come somewhat different. But Macoplay will takes into account to some, some effect, but we didn't check actually these magnitudes. So now if we speak of, or industry or geophysics more generally, the favored way to discuss sort of intuitively uh, inception of, uh, of fractures is by morph Coulomb envelope. So we can plot more Coulomb envelope for the various stages, uh, the, the stage of low compressions, uh, uh, low precarial compression, which is here. There seems to be so-called morphic envelope for the stress state in the, in the process zone uh, where it matters. But if we come to the weakening stage, no way. These are uh, ends of the circles, which will go out of the picture, but you see there is no involved. Uh, Morphal more criteria in my opinion, cannot be used to judge uh, fail in this case. Uh, uh, it is, uh, although it is widely used. Now a fascinating problem uh, for me particularly has been uh, shear fail of beams and slabs in concrete. There is a reinforcement, the purple curve, and these are tests, uh, okay, this is part of the beam, shear force here, bending moment from the rest of the beam, uh, eruption, these are tests uh, by Teichmann uh, uh, for several different sizes, uh, similar specimens, the uh, cracks are for different sizes, always very similar. They grow and they grow in mode one at the beginning, opening cracks. But then the failure is in compression here. Now, many people try to model it with cohesive crack model or early FM. Nobody succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are, there are dozens of papers on this and no success. Uh, now we know why because this crack parallel stress, it's failing by compression here. Uh, so it basically reduces the factor to zero. There is no stress singularity. Some pictures, some people even today make pictures of stress singularity and softening curve. There's no softening curve here. At the beginning, yes, then it propagates, but that's the final point. And this curve is post-peak. And there, of course, the shears like that and wedge comes up and then the failure. So I think it's finally, in my mind, at least it's completely understood, there are many disasters which uh, uh, fail in this way, especially an earthquake. This one is not earthquake. So 
uh, this is one uh, illumination from our gap test. Now, multi scale approach is a great approach, and uh, it has been applied to uh, introduce test field effects, which is a correct way to do that uh, uh, by some people like the board, Riedelman, Remmers, recently. Uh, and they shrank the damage band into a line. Uh, so the line is a cohesive correct, which will be bad, but they impose embedded, multi scale embedded or subscale tensile damage band of a finite width. So one crack is fine enough, but uh, uh, the tensile damage law is also the question calibration by test data. But the main problem is if it, the band is shrunken to a line, how do you impose? the case of pile cracks. And pile cracks uh, have a certain spacing. So you would need to some embellishment, some, something more to, uh, to model this kind of situations, which are very frequent, of course. Uh, uh, the phase field model also a great thing co-opted from physics. Initially it was for scale behavior, uh, uh, but it's uh, the model with the use in the phase field, I uh, open up uh, inadequate for practical applications, single parameter damage, where it exists. Certainly not concrete composites, uh, uh, that's not the case. Uh, so uh, it needs a realistic tensile model related, such as microplane. But again, the transition from distributed damage, you often start, uh, this was going to be typical distributed damage, then it localizes. So you need to start with a field of damage. And then eventually goes into one band. So how do you do it with the existing uh, phase model? I believe some significant generalizations all uh, needed. You have this parameter C uh, of damage parameter, single parameter, it goes from uh, one to zero to one. Uh, so it had this distributed field uh, uh, goes sinusoidal up and down. And so there is, uh, is a great promise, but I think much improvement is needed. Another case where this test provides illumination is, uh, is the fracture of sea ice. Uh, it has been great interest for uh, oil platforms, for example. In Prudhoe Bay, a ice plate two meters thick is pushing against uh, against leg of an oil platform. Uh, the, uh, the ice flow is several miles large. So, uh, uh, what is the force? So it was calculated in the 1980s by Farnham and program finite strain uh, buckling over the plate, uh, of course, uh, damage source. Uh, and it was over predicted by uh, actual plastic loss, sorry, over predicted by order of magnitude. So then uh, uh, ONR organized uh, expensive tests, 500 miles north, north, north of Canada. Uh, in the Arctic, uh, they were done by Dempsey, uh, originally from a Western professor at Clarkson now, and at that time I uh, went with him. Uh, uh, and he tested specimens, uh, this is edge of the specimen, 80 by 80 meters in size. As you see, he floating, separated from the about 1.8 meters, 1 .8 meters thick and expanded by flat jacks uh, uh, to, uh, to measure the fracture energy. And uh, the results uh, led to the following picture. It was thought there is no fracture sensitivity from the lab tests, which are here. This is 80 meters here. Uh, it came, uh, it showed that the fracture process zone is about five meters. And then eventually comes to linear elastic fracture mechanics. The size effect significantly decreased the prediction of the five forces of the platform, but not quite, not quite order of magnitude. And today I know why, because this crack parallel stress decreased the fracture energy for sure. There's a large crack parallel stress, and that probably provides a complete explanation. Uh, fascinating problem, very illuminating. Uh, an interesting problem is, of course, bone. Uh, fractures uh, in legs happen under axial compression often and uh, other, in other bones. So 
uh, which has shown recently that uh, actually needs to use cohesive model, not LEFM. So there is softening and long tail. We showed by testing cow bones, specimens cut one cow bone to minimize scatter, one to two, four incisors plotted here. We showed there is a significant side effect about midway for this bone between plasticity and refraction mechanics, significant. And that has not been taken out in, in biomechanics to, to, as far as I know. But the correction needed, but again, the, uh, this uh, LEFM would have to be plotted for different detail for different fracture energy because of the correct polar effect. Uh, another case I want to mention where surely there is an effect. We tested in uh, 19, uh, 1990s uh, specimens of uh, polyethylene letter ketone peak, a uni unidirectional compression with notches. And we showed that the king bands which propagate uh, uh, actually follow fracture mechanics. And then there is a side effect. Uh, there is a softening, partial softening due to microbuckling, then it grows. And the side effect was shown to be very large actually uh, in this case. And now, of course, the question is what uh, in practice, often there will be crack power stress, so there will change. Uh, I don't know how, but it's another thing to illuminate, but uh, certainly of practical interest. Now we spoke of critical cracks. Now subcritical cracks grow. Uh, we have Paris law for cyclic growth, cyclic fatigue, Charles Evans law for static fatigue. We showed for concrete in 1991 that because the large process zone is not like in steel, that uh, the increment of crack lengths per cycle log logarithmic versus in a logarithm of the satisfactory amplitude uh, causes uh, uh, change of size. These are three different sizes, changes the shift, which eventually stabilizes. The shift is significant. And uh, surely that will be affected by crack power stress, which didn't use this test. So that should be done. In the gap test, it could be done with the crack power compression. The same thing for static fatigue, important in uh, geophysics. Now we spoke of mode one. Of course, there is an effect in mode two. And this is clear from this test we did Northwestern in 1990, uh, tensile aspect of sheave fracture. So if we have a, uh, a circumferential notch and twist, we get a plain sheave fracture uh, as shown here. This is, now, if we introduce axial compression and we didn't analyze it at that time, uh, we get a cone. Uh, and that's a compression just like that in pre stress concrete structures, but uh, less than half the strength. And so obviously there is an effect of, uh, of crack power stress here, it will be present here, none. none. So uh, that's another thing to uh, consider. And this is my final comment. What about geological faults? Now, geological fault is very thin. Uh, uh, less than one millimeter, but at front, there must be a process zone and it is probably not a line, line zone. It has probably some width. And if it has width, then the sigma XX and also sigma ZZ vertical, both would have a method for propagation. And that should be included in the calculations of the propagation of these faults. So that's a speculation, of course, but uh, uh, I think it's something to look into that uh, effect, uh, depending on the width of the process on the, the front of the fault. And it will affect pristess concrete, where cracks like to grow parallel to compression. They will be affected. Probably uh, the stoppage is not high, so the GF will be increased. And final comment, uh, I don't know, MEMS, micrometer size experiments, uh, the process zone is now uh, compared to devices, uh, like MEMS or various uh, polysilicon and uh, chips and so forth is not insignificant and the effect will be probably present. And with this, I would like to conclude. So gap test is simple, unambiguous, and the study determinant system makes it easy to interpret. Fracture process on tensorial, we need to use some tensile model like crack by model or some more sophisticated ones. 
uh, cohesive crack uh, model, uh, uh, LEFM, uh, have a limited applicability. If we know the crack processes are negligible, fine, but if they are large, the, uh, adapting then is difficult. We need to switch actually to tensor models. Now, on the other hand, I would like to emphasize that LEFM and CCM cohesive model remain essential for understanding and teaching fracture mechanics. Otherwise, we can understand it, what's happening. And they're essential also for providing accurate benchmark solutions, which we have to, to match to them, to calibrate with them tensor model for damage. There are many of such solutions. So this is, these models remain indispensable. And finally, uh, I must admit, our evidence is scant. Uh, we need many more tests. In fact, we need extensive testing in the future, much more than we can do at Northwestern, much more than one lab can do of all kinds of problems which will be affected by this. And uh, to read for many different materials, I listed, of course, for fractal composites, for uh, the ceramics, especially uh, toughened or tough ceramics, for uh, uh, geomaterials, uh, rocks, and so forth. So I think uh, it leaves a great, uh, great fun for us ahead. So as an afterthought, many hard research subjects become closed in a few decades. But like uh, turbulence, fracture mechanics is different. This formidable subject has been researched for a century and probably will for another century. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Derek. Fascinating talk with uh, many interesting uh, discussion of applications and uh, ideas for future research. So really interesting. Uh, I think we can now go to questions from the panelists if uh, you will have to unmute yourself, and if you raise your hand, I will set the order so we we can proceed with the question and answer session. Uh, Horacio, this is Tony Vas. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, Zelene, great talk. I have a question on your torsion tests. Yes. You, you showed a torsion test where you said without any compression, you had a clean fracture, but when you put compression, you got a cone. But but where is the crack parallel? That's perpendicular to the crack. You you oh, said yeah, you you right. this is this is not exactly demonstration what I was saying. Crack parallel would be there is slight crack parallel on the cone. The cone. There is both crack parallel and crack normal, and there I is see. no crack parallel on the on the flat. But right. uh, obviously the stress state. That's my point. I should have said it more clearly. Fractality right. matters. It's a good point. Sorry, I forgot to mention that you raised sure. the right question. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, you, you have a question? Oh, yeah, I have a question. So, oh, uh, thank you very much for the good talk. And uh, so, my question is that uh, how do you delineate fracture process zone and irreversible deformation zones? <laughs> Buying all of them yes, as a course, uh, irreversible transformation zones. You know, like you speak of different materials, of course. In, in concrete, we don't speak about that. We didn't test it. Now that has to be, of course, uh, discussed. And uh, maybe you can contribute to that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, in some materials, this is a uh, uh, irreversible transformation is an important point. Uh, I didn't discuss that. It's a, it's a very good point. Uh, Let okay. it be uh, clarified. But I still believe the main uh, effect, the width of the process zone, that's mainly crack parallel, crack, parallel cracks. It cannot be done definitively by setting one crack, which, is, uh, uh, which has been my, main, my point for a long time. And this time even more that uh, even for this transitional zone, uh, you need to look what happens if there are more cracks, not just one. Okay. And that can be induced by eigen stresses. So I have another quick question. So, I mean, you have shown very nice uh, neck or the compressive sigma XX test, right? 
So yes. typically, how do you make a positive sigma xx test? So with positive, yes, tangent. So yeah, tens ten how do you apply the tensile sigma xx? Yeah, this has been discussed for a long time for concrete, it's tricky. Dog bone specim specimens are one way, but not the best. I believe better is uh, glued by epoxy, thin layer, very thin layer on rigid platens, but then you have effect of Poisson ratio at the end, which actually causes the fracture to fall away. This is not accepted as direct tension, but more frequently is an easier to use Brazilian test, crack splitting specimen, which of course is a biaxial tension. It's a compression and tension. So it's not quite the same, but it's accepted as a sort of measure of tensile strengths. We know empirically its relation to uh, direct tensile strengths. Uh, it's actually an ACI code. It has not been enough for the other met for some other methods. The question has not been researched actually. Uh, yes, there more work needs to be done, but for concrete, I think this has been discussed for 50 years. <laughs> it's relatively clear. Okay, thank you. So I have some more, but I, I want to let other people ask first, okay? Okay, pleasure. Time. So thank, you. thank you for asking. Go ahead. Anyone? Yes. Uh, uh, you to unmute. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the presentation and really for pushing us forward in the field of fracture mechanics of quasi-brittle materials. I yes. think uh, on, on behalf of uh, the ACI 446 committee, just want to thank you for really pushing us to not, uh, you know, stagnating on the same research. Um, I have a, several questions, but again, I just want to at least have a chance to have uh, one question. What do we notice when we use DIC on different sizes of uh, the three-point bend uh, test is that the fracture process zone, as it expands before the peak and after the peak, it also expands in the width. But at the peak, the width of the fracture process zone is still much smaller than what it would be in the post-peak. So what I was curious is when you decided the width of your pads, uh, would that also influence the, this uh, effect on GF? Because if now I have a fairly large pad with the compression, but my fracture process zone in width is still very small, then I have a mixed uh, uh, compression effect because the micro cracking is not in the same width as my compression. So I was wondering if in the future it would be important to try different uh, widths of the compression zone. Uh, yes, of course, how to influence it, right? So we achieve a relatively uniform compression zone. Uh, uh, as, as, uh, I mean, as long as the rest of the specimen is elastic, but that's a good point. Uh, of course, uh, I must admit the uh, scientific method gives you the referred to peak, right? Because everything is derived from peak loads. It doesn't tell us what happens before the peak and does not what happens afterwards, which is important for other things, so for especially for impact and such things. Yes, that's a raise a good point. Uh, I cannot answer it, but probably the, in this test, well, we could, uh, for example, widen the. Uh, uh, the pads, we can maybe make them narrower. That's also a question we pondered. We get different dis uh, different distributions of compression stress uh, uh, near the process zone. So various things could be done with this test, but maybe you need to invent some other types of tests. Uh, yeah, you pointed out something that is a real, really interest. I, uh, and I am so glad you participated because you decide you are the chair of the ACI committee, <laughs> powerful committee on fracture. <laughs> Thank you so much, Zenek. Yes. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, uh, Zenek, excellent talk, and thank you for giving the presentation. And I'd like to pinpoint on scale effects. And uh, let's concentrate on concrete so that we don't diverge to ice or other things. How, what physical experiment, I mean, would you encourage us to try to obtain the length scales. I mean, we know in metals, we use nano indentation. Would something similar 
uh, do for concrete or do you have some other ideas? Of course, for different lens scales, you use different grain sizes. So we have another issue there. Yes, excellent question, of course. In concrete, we mainly rely on these tests I've shown, but uh, there are developments, specifically at MIT. I, I noticed that Franz Ulm is present. He can probably uh, comment more. They do, they, they haven't done an orientation, but they did. And an orientation uh, will tell us different things. And that's, uh, again, a test that obviously uh, the splitting mode one is combined with high critical compression and a big, uh, big inelastic damage zone. Uh, yeah, I, you showed something important, but uh, we don't have answer. I, half of my talk is what is not known, what is speculative, what we need to do. So I'm adding to that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, a John one who would like to ask a question, sure. Hi, Zanek. Great to see you. Great to hear you. Thank you very much for that. As you know, I gave up kind of working on fracture a long time ago. It was too hard for me. Um, I, I noticed that uh, you've mentioned quite a few times on your slides the potential importance of sigma ZZ as well as sigma XX. Yes. Has much actually been done with allowing for sigma ZZ as well? Yeah, is it good point. We have not done it, but uh, I imagine we could do the test uh, uh, confined by fluid uh, with a rubber membrane so it doesn't penetrate into concrete under high pressure. That seems to be feasible. Uh, we haven't done it yet. Actually, we would have done much more tests uh, uh, because the virus stopped us, of course. <laughs> yeah. You, you also was done uh, by uh, March 20. <laughs> yeah. you, you also mentioned um that modeling damage seriously modeling damage is, is still very hard and people don't know exactly what to do so i suppose also allowing for sigma zz makes that story even worse but, uh, yes that's another dimension <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's three dimensional well, right and uh, sigma xz or tau xz that that's ah oh, yes yes uh, yes effect two actually yes. Uh, I, I think I mentioned that uh, uh, that Remmers and De Boris and Needleman uh, shrank the crack band, mo crack band model basically or whatever into a plane, uh, including Sigma XZ. Now it was speculative. They had no data, of course, but uh, and in our model it's easily included theoretically, but to get data, it's uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, some clever yeah. mind needs to invent different tests. <laughs> Thank you. Scott. Yes. Huh? Yeah. Hi, Zenik. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. It's uh, great. Uh, my question is uh, when you have a sigma XX, oh, the stress parallel to crack, now you change it, the, the fracture process zone and the shape. And uh, you also mentioned the micro cracks in the proce uh, pro fracture process zone, uh, maybe uh, changing the, the way of the propagation or maybe uh, the mechanism changing to exactly. from opening to sliding. Or Now my uh, question is, uh, is the shape mainly is a shape changing or shape the size changing of the fracture process zone? due to uh, the sigma x? Good point. We have some thoughts about that. Uh, I showed that the fracture prozone apparently widens. And the widening would be consistent with the fact that you, with crack parallel stress, you generate slip. And slip on inclined plates leads to widening of the zone, obviously. We know that from, from the more classical model of uh, uh, of uh, wingtip cracks, right? They, they cause also widening. So that's like um, thousands of wingtip cracks there. So that's speculation, but uh, the CF, which is a measure, general measure of the size of the process zone is, is decreasing at the end when this happens significantly. So it means fracture process localizing. 
Now the CF uh, by, by derivation, of course, it relates to the length dimension, but the length dimension are related to transverse dimensions. So it is, we need perhaps some more refined analysis, damage mechanics to interpret this. So I agree with you, it changes that we have some indication, but we need uh, much better modeling. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, just let me turn me my microphone on. Thank you very much for this nice lecture. Uh, I mean, listening to you and listening to the question, I was wondering, did you try to run some uh, mesoscale analysis, let's, with, for instance, with the lattice models uh, of uh, Gianluca or, or any yeah, other, to see if this uh, widening of the process zone because of uh, biaxial or triaxial state of stress would be due to heterogeneities. Yes, uh, that's actually planned. Gianluca uh, no. Cusatis and uh, Madura Patiraj, who was listed among the co-authors, and mm -hmm. I uh, are preparing a paper on that, actually. Uh, uh, try to model this test with LDPM. Yeah. This is a lattice particle model, and I think that will mean a lot. This mesoscale modeling, particle modeling for concrete, uh, maybe modeling with fiber buckling and so forth for composites is essential for understanding. Yeah. I made a brief mention of it, glad that you emphasize that because that's, uh, that's something we need to focus on. And it's the, uh, of course, must match the experiments, but if you match them, you can be confident to extrapolate. That's yeah. you always do, right? Mm. Uh, so uh, I, I, it's in the process actually. Okay. I, I, <laughs> I hope to maybe have a paper in the fall. <laughs> Gianluca Cusat is leading it. Uh, and Patio Madura is still staying as a postdoc. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, that's the plan. Right. And there are other ways to model it, of course. There are other models uh, uh, which are also good. Yeah. Uh, uh, any model which you would- Your models, uh, right? Yeah, any model in, in which you would uh, represent the material heterogeneity would, would be nice, provided yes. it And it's possible. very important to develop these models for fiber components. Mm -hmm. uh, woven or parallel, uh, that's, that's a challenge because this, this effect will be manifested exactly this way, how to measure otherwise. If okay. I, uh, yes? I have another question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering why in the gap tests, why didn't you use just, I mean, screws and bolts to apply this sigma XX stress? <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, because the frame. in doing that, you would be able to change the magnitude of the stress. Yeah, we could imp impose a crack parallel strain, of course. Yeah. By a very rigid frame. Yeah. You have some. But of course, uh, uh, there is creep. Uh, stresses in concrete relax. Now, relaxation from application one tenth of a second to one hour is about 30% of the stress. Yeah. It's okay. major at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, very difficult to capture the beginning and extrapolate. Mm -hmm. And then it is enormous. Uh, in other materials, uh, not as bad. So, yeah, that could be done. Uh, then, of course, there comes the clamp will have weight. So uh, it has to be something very, very stiff, mm -hmm. rigid. And that somewhat complicates the analysis because you would have to do a uh, side effect method with, uh, uh, it can be done, of course, uh, uh, with uh, dissimilar specimens, but yeah. it's uh, more complicated. Uh, now, if uh, the elastic phenomena uh, yeah, we chose to prescribe stress, okay. <laughs> but it should, <laughs> okay. it should be done. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Sedanik, uh, I have a question regarding the sea ice example you showed with uh, Dempsey's test results. Yes. You said that uh, now I know the answer. It's the crack parallel compression. Can Only you explain? Uh, partly, right. But can you explain where you get that? Is it residual compression or where is oh. the, okay, is the so compression? You know, the, the problem is that sea ice is not stationary. Uh, in, uh, it is moving mm -hmm. and it is driven by uh, sea currents and wind. And if you take 
uh, area of Venice Square now bounds this force is enormous, enormous, mm -hmm. cannot be stopped. Mm -hmm. So actually the force, uh, they see that the sea ice is pushing on the platform, create the crack, it, uh, spreading the ice around. You see a trail of it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a major phenomenon. So that's been recognized, of course, in, uh, in ice mechanics, sea ice mechanics for a long time. But another aspect is, of course, uh, ice breaking, where you would have have it like two, uh, uh, pushing against ice. But in, uh, in these uh, platforms, it is a major effect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, yes, go ahead. You need to unmute yourself. Good first. Okay, all right. I, as I uh, mentioned, I'll come back for another question. So that is uh, the one that you mentioned about uh, shale rock fracture with the anisotropic fracture mechanics, right? Yes. So for that, you know, even elastic solutions, uh, uh, the, stress state or head of the crack tip is not equibiaxial, so they have some kind of uh, I mean, deviation. Yeah, there are some approximate solutions like Gao, uh, right. Bao, Bao in 1990s, right? We, we know, yes. Right, but, but when you introduce a damage or even plasticity, either way, depends on your deformation mechanisms, you can actually uh, reverse the, uh, the biaxiality so the sign in a sense so have you thought about uh, that all those uh, damage process uh, depending on the sigma xx that actually makes the uh, instability of stress sectors in uh, anisotropic uh, fracture processes well the process will change a lot to some extent it should be captured by the tensor damage model even better if we, yeah, Kusatis also is working on a particle model for uh, to, to clarify shale. Uh, the particles are not so visible, it's somewhat artificial, but it gives good results. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there will be changes of uh, uh, big effects of fraction propagate different directions. Uh, we use the model which was published, which was calibrated by many uh, compression test in various angles to uh, the bedding layers. Now we show that actually the microplane ferrocellular model is better than any tensor model because it captures one thing that when you have uh, uniaxial specimens cut out of shale, either normal or inclined or parallel, as you change the angle of inclination, uh, the shear resistance goes monotonic down and out. Mm. And this, I think, is almost impossible to catch with invariance, which give you always monotonic behavior from one from the perpendicular to the lateral. Uh, in this case, you uh, you need something capturing the uh, slips with particle direction, which uh, tensor models cannot do. Uh, if you have something like I1J2, which is uh, slip with no particle direction, in practice, is always a definite direction, and uh, Michael may want to do that. L uh, particle models even better. Okay. So um, I think this aspect of uh, slip uh, introduced by compression different uh, is will be very important. That needs to be studied now. Uh, Los Alamos, uh, 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 Viswanathan, and uh, Esteban, Esteban Rugier and uh, Luke Frey. Uh, planning test for this, so it, it will be done, but it takes time, of course, and they cannot do anything right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Horacio, I want to point out that there are many questions in the uh, chat box. Yes, yes, I was going to go to the chat now. Okay. So, there is a comment by Florin Bobaru in okay. relation to, to the the analogy between turbulence and fracture, and he's given a link. And uh, Ken Chong mentioned that he would like to make a comment live. Okay, sure. If you would like to, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, I'll, I'll... Well, I don't know, if he's there. The, the, there is another question by Jaime Hernandez. 
I'm curious if Professor Bajan has any comments regarding applications to asphalt concrete at low and intermediate temperature. So the question is about uh, the implications of this work on uh, asphalt, concrete, at low and intermediate temperatures. So I'm okay, sure. so asphalt concrete. Cold asphalt concrete is very brittle. It's very much like concrete and it's a big interest in Minnesota where my former student, now professor, uh, John Le, he, or uh, Lavoos, uh, uh, chair department, my former graduate, they tested asphalt concrete and they found a significant side effect deviating from linear fracture mechanics. So there is a large fracture process zone and they have done it on standard tests with no power stress. It's of big interest and I think they would be well positioned to do that, to do the same test with parallel stress, uh, which surely is important because in pavement, these cracks are vertical mainly, and they happen on the wheels, and the wheels impose big crack parallel stress, which probably reduce the fracture energy almost to zero. So that's uh, also one important application which will be affected by the crack parallel stress. Uh, okay, I agree. Okay, there is another uh, question from Irane. Should uh, I unmute? In, in the gap test under biaxial stress, do you observe turning of the crack, deviation from the straight path? And is the failure geometrically similar for various sizes? My answer to both is available. We did not see a deviation to the side. It is generally not seen in these tests. There are actually there are many tests without the crack power stress, also they go straight. If you introduce mixed mode loading, of course, then they go sideways. That's also well known, but we don't do that here. The mixed mode loading would be of interesting too, where you shift uh, asymmetrically the loads and uh, has been done with accurate power stress. Now it can be done with it. And the second is uh, uh, if, we, uh, if it's, uh, what was it? If it deviates to the side, I say no. And the second part was what? Okay. Second part of the question was. Uh, oh, the second part of the question was about uh, uh, the the effect on on the, any deviations on different sizes of the samples. Okay, so my answer is no. For different for different sizes, go same way, straight, straight, no deviation, and that's essential actually for the analysis. Otherwise, size effect method would not apply, and that's seen in many materials that we test the size effect method. But uh, size uh, does not affect that. Okay. Uh, Ken apparently has a comment now. He seems to be on mute. So, uh, Ken, are you listening? Somehow we cannot hear you. Sorry. <laughs> there is another question by Kanner. How did you relate? How, how would you relate the effect of the crack parallel stress to the classical biaxial test data? For, for example, those of Kupfer. Yeah, these are not fracture tests, these are material tests. Right. There is a slight similarity. For example, biaxial tests show also a transition from tension to compression, which is not straight. There is, this is a well-known diagram of uh, uh, the two axes, the compression side with the bulge and the tensile side with the square. And, and there is a similarity, but it's not exactly the same thing. It will be, of course, interesting to relate. These are tests from 1950s and 60s, uh, fair known, famous, famous, well known. Uh, uh, and this, uh, uh, what we studied is the effect of biaxial with various materials. With some materials, it strengthens a lot by axial compression, and some others not. So, uh, yeah, this, uh, this needs to be studied. There is some correlation, but limited, I think. These are no notches. And go, actually, fail is, of course, a random phenomenon because the uh, crack tip is not forced to some particular point of the specimen. 
is different to relate uh, then if you have side effect you have type one side effect in these tests so different kind so it's the correlation is actually a complex question okay a any other questions from the uh, panelists Uh, I don't have a question, but I would like to thank you, Zenek, for a characteristically wonderful and uh, exciting talk. And just point out that uh, there are questions coming also through YouTube. There's a there's a few in the Q and A here, some of which didn't get answered. And uh, there's a live chat on YouTube. And you'll be happy to know, Zenek, that at the peak there were about 500 people, I think, combined between YouTube and uh, and Zoom Zoom here lifted, uh, listening. I think we're down to about 250 now. So uh, I, I won't uh, feel any of those, but if, if you would like, Horacio, I could read some out or- uh, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go sure, ahead. go ahead. So there was one that we, we missed that came early on uh, from uh, Steffi Steven. Can you please explain in which part of a structure uh, you would expect to see crack parallel compression stresses? Well, I showed one. I showed the uh, uh, shear fatal beams or slabs. So then you get a significant crack power stress, major, in fact, it dominates at maximum load. Uh, now there are many other shear type situations in shells, uh, in corners, in, in columns, of course, column failure is typically under, uh, the crack would be inclined with a component of crack power stress. Uh, uh, you have more complicated situations, how to analyze. Uh, it's a good point. And it's something to be researched more. And then uh, there were a few questions that came through to this effect that uh, I'll just summarize by saying, uh, how can fracture energies and stress crack width be linked to design of concrete structures? I think uh, the, the sort of summarizing some of these questions that I'm seeing here is how, how can your analysis and, and these results be incorporated into actual design of concrete structures? Well, there are big questions in design. In America, ACI is basically result, yeah, we should follow fracture mechanics in, in brittle failures. In other codes, in European codes, no. They still have uh, arguments which are based on sort of, uh, in my view, simplistic arguments of uh, uh, beam time mechanics, uh, 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 or uh, in, uh, intuitive uh, mechanisms like it is pictured that that diagonal shear crack opens like a wedge, which is true at the uh, true at the beginning at half of the load, but not a max load. I think this analysis should affect the codes a lot. Uh, ACI has fracture mechanics, but no other code does, and uh, it affects. Uh, safety margins, which are of course very big, but if you want to be economic, they would have to be reduced. Uh, if you want to increase safety, they would. Uh, uh, in Europe, it is different. Uh, and uh, I know if they introduce this uh, simple beam dam analysis, ignore fracture maker will be a mistake, but we need to engage them in the discussions. Uh, so effect is enormous. now. You are in geotechnical field. <laughs> I think there are some implications too. <laughs> yeah, in, indeed. And keep in mind, these are my. I have my own questions, but I'm going to reserve those for when I can uh, you know, get to ask them in person again. <laughs> um, and, and then, Horacio, I see there are more questions coming in through the Q and A. I don't know if you want to. How long you want to keep this going, or uh, if you want to ask those? Well, maybe read it. You could read a couple of from. Two more from YouTube and uh, maybe one or two more here. I will, and then we can close. Yeah, I think I think we have the ones from YouTube pretty well covered. Uh, oh, okay. of congratulatory oh. remarks, uh, and it's just the ones here. Right. Uh, here is a, a, a Miguel Besa. Thank you for your for the lecture, Professor Bajant. You ended with an inspiring note on the future of the field. I'm curious to hear if you have any thoughts about the role of machine learning in modeling materials. Well, <laughs> it's a very <laughs> ponderous question, of course. We know machine learning is important, but I don't know how this particular gap that we would have found by machine learning. 
it requires some different thinking. <laughs> uh, maybe machine learning would help us to improve the tensor models, but still you have to start with some intelligent arguments or ethical, and then to my machine learning improve all that. So I think, yes, it's a very important direction of abuse. Many people just go to machine learning, like uh, there are, I know there are proposals well-funded to forget all fracture mechanics about shale and do only machine learning. I'm convinced it will go to nothing, although it's highly funded. Uh, so we have to use it, but judiciously. Uh, that's my view. Right. There is another uh, uh, question from uh, Dines Cati. Thanks for your inspiring talk. Oil shales are stratified rocks with a strati a stratification of about one millimeter. Can you provide your insight in appropriate tests and models to evaluate parameters for hydraulic fracturing simulation? Okay, so we agree that hydraulic fracture is a fracture phenomenon as the word suggests. So far, has been modeled by linear fracture mechanics or by particle models. But particle models which don't have all the features that we, we just uh, rather simplified. Uh, now, I, I think that the fracture tests which matter are, well, we need to do them on course, of course. There's another challenge which have to be preserved, unloading uh, of the core, the moisture aspects. Uh, uh, I think illuminating is a test which they are doing at Los Alamos, uh, cooperating with me, uh, modeling the behavior of hydraulic cracks with plaster, which is uh, which has weak zones cast that way. But still, I think fracture tests like three point bend with parallel compression is, is a major test to uh, use. Uh, and, and of course, uh, strength test uh, that's also, also necessary. Uh, uh, test with shear probably is, uh, uh, we know that hydraulic fracture may go to shear fracture. So uh, this is more challenging. So I can't comment in detail, but we are working on it. I'm involved in a team with in Los Alamos, which does exactly that. Uh, I cannot be more, more definite about this. Important point. Okay, so... <laughs> Here is another question from Rita Esposito. Thank you, Professor Vadian, for your talk. How do you think we could do a gap test when characterizing the fracture properties of existing structures on site? Well, on site, it's, the equipment is relatively simple. It is uh, simple than some other ideas. It's, uh, you would have to bring, uh, the base which uh, would uh, quickly do the uh, produce a gap and use a standard specimen. Three point by specimens are used, for example, there are also cylinders, cores uh, with cuts to the work as three point band that can be used. Uh, I think it's feasible, but it requires more thinking. It's a, it's a very important question how to do it on site. Uh, 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 either as an evaluation of existing structures or, or in, in construction that uh, uh, needs further work. I mean, half of my, <laughs> half my talk was there is much research needed on this line. Okay, there is another one here. Uh, the Professor Badian, thank you for the excellent lecture. This is uh, Hoolin Xu asking. I would like to ask a question about experiments. Due to the randomness of brittle fracture, just like turbulence, so in order to get rules, principles, how many experiments do we need to do? Or are there any good ways to conduct the experiments, like machine learning mentioned before? Very good question. I didn't mention on that. The side effect method has a big advantage uh, in uh, overcoming randomness. Uh, if you want to test uh, uh, strength with coefficient variation uh, by, uh, let's say, compression tests or tensile tests, you need to do uh, probably hundreds of tests. 
but in uh, in the scientific method, they use three sizes, and you have scatter, but you do regression, and the regression line. This is what you need. And regression line has much less scatter than the individual test, much less. It is the uncertainty of regression line of a, a correlation variation of regression line compared to a, a very no thing in statistics compared to individual tests. So uh, the size of the method is a big advantage here that uh, it uh, reduces the number of specimens. We generally need, uh, we use three for each size, uh, probably we should use six, but not more. And the sizes were one to two, three to nine, which is better, one to two to uh, four. And then coefficient variation can be brought down and it was shown by the test of Hoover under 2% for concrete, which is, which is remarkable. Normally concrete testing uh, is 8% coefficient variation in, in, in tensile compression tests. So uh, this uh, uh, reducing it to regression different sizes greatly reduces uh, coefficient variations and uncertainty of the testing. So I'm glad you uh, this question was raised. I see. Okay, very nice. And there are actually many papers on that. Even my book also points that out with panels. So uh, I have a question uh, myself. So in the case of ceramics, the characteristic, the characteristic dimension of the microstructure is the grain size. Yes. In concrete, one would say is the aggregate size. So do you have any uh, suggestions for the selection of the size scales, the three size scales to be used in relation to these characteristic dimensions? Uh, yes, we actually, and I study that quite a lot. We used, we didn't test ceramics, but there are plenty of data in the literature. So uh, the problem was the size related to the distribution of strengths of uh, quadrupedal specimens. And we found it deviates from Weibull, it's a Gauss Weibull on the large size. And where the transition is from Gaussian uh, on small size and to Weibull on the large size, determines the fracture process on size. And uh, it actually impacts also on the deterministic analysis because it gives you deterministic numbers. So if you, uh, in, in ceramics, uh, the fact that there is a transitional side effect in notch specimens, and there is a gauss weibull transition in, uh, in unnotched specimens uh, implies the process on size and of course implies the side effect and that's confirmed. So uh, everything matches together. Uh, in, in fact, you don't need to do testing of viable modules by doing hysteretic, uh, uh, doing a uh, great number of tests, uh, histograms. Uh, uh, you need to do different sizes to get the same result much more precise and quickly. Thank you. Okay, so I will read. Oh, Hanchen, yeah, you need to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay, could I? Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I don't have a question, but I have a quick comment. And first of all, uh, Dinek, this is a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. The concept is a very insightful. You know, the analytical theory is, is a very elegant. I think that's a great. But thinking about this, uh, this uh, complex, the complexity of this problem, uh, I wanted to revisit the early uh, question or comment regarding machine learning. Other two related uh, small community like a materials modeling, like a manufacturing, have uh, started looking into the integration of uh, you know, materials or manufacturing with artificial intelligence. Uh, coming October, the, the ASM, the Materials Society, has, uh, has a panel to talk about the integration. It's not easy because you have a group of computer scientists doing machine learning or artificial intelligence, then you have uh, people talking, you know, this count complex of fracture or other things. But I do think this, this group may want it to uh, put a little bit more emphasis on the integration, the integration of uh, AI, the artificial intelligence, and the mechanics in general. Uh, in particular, you know, this, this is a problem you pointed out that when you have sigma XX or sigma ZZ, how that impact 
the, uh, the uh, GF. So uh, that's just a suggestion. Maybe there's a group who wanted to put a little more um, uh, emphasis on, on, on that integration of AI and the mechanics. Thank you. Great talk. Very, very important points. I don't disparage, of course, artificial learning, AI, artificial intelligence, but you would need lots of data for that. They would need lots of tests. So uh, that takes time. Yeah. Uh, I, there uh, have been no tests done anywhere. If every, all the world start doing these tests, yes, then we can probably do artificial intelligence. But if one lab is doing it, uh, <laughs> that's no way because there are not enough data. That's true. Uh, yeah. But if thousands of labs are doing it, yes, we can do artificial intelligence and get more, more insight. So it's, a, it, it's bringing together two completely different philosophies, right? One philosophy is through the mechanics and the modeling with all the tensorial characteristics of the constitutive laws is gaining a lot of insight with some sort of parametrization. Machine learning is more, if I don't know all those things, how can I extract information nonetheless? So it's bringing together two completely philosophies, right? And there is kind of, uh, we need to think about how, how we deal with that because I think you would have people in the two camps, but like Zenek is suggesting for machine learning, you need a lot of data. And that's, that's why people try to use uh, analysis and computation to see how you can extract a still understanding without that uh, massive investment. I, would read I still one. think that in machine learning, you, if you have no model, no theory, some, some problem, then it's essential. But if you have a good model, it should be used for improving that model, not replacing it, throwing it away. That's true. I think the, the machine learning is never going to replace the modern or the theory. You know, the elegant theory really take a first order physics and you, okay. you get that. But with, with the machine learning or artificial intelligence, you can, uh, Somehow, uh, I think uh, you incorporate the complex, the complexity into yeah, an elegant theory. You said it exactly right. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. That's a, good, that's a good point. It, it could be used to refine some of the uh, elements that we use in mechanics, for instance. And, and indeed, for instance, people are using machine learning to parameterize force fields at the atomic level, for instance, right? Yes, so yes, you could have machine learning used at different scales with different purpose. And uh, maybe that's the way you're integrating it. I have one last question that I will read and, and probably we will finish with this. Uh, the question is from uh, Ram Singh. He says, uh, you mentioned about turbulence and the fact that there are different observations at different length scales. For quasi brittle fracture, how this would manifest in terms of lens case of obs and observations if we, we visualize the, the formation fields with digital image correlation? Well, lens case is essential, of course. If we would be build concrete structure, uh, I once proposed a plate floating on styrofoam on a lake, 700 meters each direction, we would surely see linear fracture mechanics in regular concrete. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we uh, are interested in certain scales only, right? So, uh, but if we change scale, we will be totally different. If uh, that's why I also think that in metals, like you tested, uh, for example, thin films, and in thin films, you actually, I think, were the first to demonstrate there is a post-peak softening, gradual softening. Right. Now, gradual softening actually implies uh, that there ought to be also a finer process zone mattering, uh, not fully localizing, and that there will be side effect. So uh, I think in thin films, you would have similar, similar phenomenon. Uh, uh, I don't know how to test it uh, on, on the micrometer scale, on the scale of thin films. Uh, in fact, uh, my, uh, uh, we studied here and, uh, uh, and John expanded that. We studied my chips, computer chips. 
there are several phenomena and not in fracture only is also in uh, uh, in electric uh, in, uh, in tunneling clusters through the penetration of current through the, through the chips and uh, recently he tested with boys at sandia uh, uh, in a slack test tester many tested decimals hundreds hundreds of polysilicon and uh, demonstrated that on the scale of chips or micrometers there is a strong side effect and characteristic lengths. So uh, thermal stresses actually should be analyzed, taking this into account. But the new is, I think, a very significant result that they got. Uh, and this, this kind of thing should be pursued. Now, an interesting, I don't understand it. If there is effect on a fracture process micrometer scale, now, if micrometer scale determines totally the fracture energy, then there should be effect on the large specimens too, because fracture energy and dissipation happens on this micrometer scale. So I don't know. So is there an effect in regular steel? <laughs> maybe not. I don't want to speculate on that. But it's an interesting point, somebody to check and maybe make sure that it's not. But uh, I'm sure that there is an effect of correct power stress and correct power shear and all that on the micrometer scale in metals. Okay, maybe the, thank then again, thank to the panelists, the audience for participating. I think that this was a very enjoyable exchange in this time of the pandemics and stay at home. Although things are reactivating now, we are getting back to some sort of normality. So I wish you a good uh, morning or even the evening, depending on where you are. And uh, we will keep in touch. Thank you then. And I wish to thank you for inviting me. Uh, a yeah. great opportunity for organizing it. It takes some effort. Thank you. A pleasure. All right. Bye now. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.